back when we were doing integrals over curves, we were integrating over, so we call these line integrals, but we were integrating over a curve, some function uh, that depended on our position times a little bit of arc length. We came up with a bunch of applications that would apply um, for either calculating the mass. So if you wanted to find the mass, you were going to sum up over that curve all the little tiny changes in mass, or all the little tiny bits of mass along that curve. And of course, um, we, we were doing that when we had some density. Since this was a one-dimensional curve, this was going to be mass per unit length times length. So this related back to a line integral like this, where the density might depend on the location. If we wanted moments, first moments were always a distance from some axis times a, times a mass. So if you're in the plane and you want to think about the moment about the x-axis, you take the distance from the x-axis, which is given by y times the mass. Of course, that's the integral over the curve of y times the density, which may depend on the position ds. Um, similarly, for the moment about the y-axis, it's x that measures the distance from the y-axis. The little bit dm is going to be density ds. Then we talked about second moments. These first moments were important in calculating um, a balance point. Remember that x bar was going to be equal to the moment about the y-axis divided by the mass. It was basically an average value for x, and y bar was going to be the moment about the x-axis divided by the mass. So these were good for sort of calculating balance points, which also helped us to represent our um, our two-dimensional wire as though it were all the mass were concentrated at a single point, the center of mass. Um, let's see. This this computation, uh, this the second moment was useful in calculating the energy, um, the kinetic energy when we were rotating something. So, um, I sub a second moment always involves a squared distance times a mass. So we had I sub x would be uh, the square of the distance from the x-axis if we're going to rotate around the x-axis. would be y squared uh, dm would again be density ds. Same deal for um, the moment about the y-axis, the, the moment of inertia. Or the second moment about the y-axis, that would be x squared density ds. Okay, so now all of these applications, the same idea is the same even if instead of having a one-dimensional wire we have a two-dimensional plate of some sort. If we want to find the mass, we're going to integrate throughout the region of that plate the little bits of mass, which again um, we'll find that, we'll have a density, this time the density will, um, will since we were talking about a two-dimensional region, it'll be mass per unit area, we'll multiply that by the area. So. We can find the mass by doing a double integral of the density times the area. Just one application of a double integral. And all these formulas will be basically the same. We're talking about a moment about the x-axis. You need to measure the distance from the x-axis and multiply by the mass. Or um, You can get the, the little bit of mass, though, by taking the density, which is a function of x and y, times the area. So do you see how all these formulas, it's the same concept of the computation. It's just it's a double integral now instead of being a line integral. Integral over r of x density dA. Um, that means we can still find the average value of x by taking m sub y divided by m. And we can find the average value of y by taking m sub x divided by m. Um, in the case where the density was constant, then there was a density in this integral and a density in that integral that came through and canceled. And so we found that x bar and y bar didn't matter. So when they talk about center of mass, then that's the general case where the density may vary as a function of position. But if they talk about the centroid, that's the case where the density is constant. And so the density doesn't really figure in the computation of where that center of mass is. So centroid, remember, is just a key word for um, the center of mass when the density is constant. Then the center of mass only depends on the geometry of the object and not on the material that it's made of. Let's see. So all these formulas just carry straight over. So instead of all, the only difference is we're integrating over a planar region 
instead of integrating over some one-dimensional curve. So a little bit of mass will be the density, which could depend on position, times the area. Since it's two-dimensional, this density is mass per unit area, so that's perfect. Mass per unit area times area makes a mass. Double integral over r of x squared dm, or the double integral over r of x squared density dA. It's a double integral. Um, this will be true as well. If you're going to spin your plate around the origin, then the distance from the origin squared is x squared plus y squared, which this just breaks up to be these two integrals. Um, the integral of x squared is i sub y, and the integral of y squared is the moment about the x-axis. So the moment about the origin is the sum of those two moments. So all the formulas just carry over. All that's changed is the type of integral you're doing. So it's the same physics, it's just a different kind of integral. So you have to, if it's two-dimensional region, you're going to have to partition in two directions. You end up with a double integral. All right, here's an example problem. We want to find the centroid of the region between the x-axis and the arch y equals sine x for x from um, 0 to pi. So if we just think about this x going from 0 to pi, then the sine goes from 0 to 1 and back again. And oops, I kind of missed there. There's pi, apparently. So uh, it's not quite a semicircle, right? Because the slope of the sine as it goes through the x-axis here is 1, and here the slope is negative 1, so unlike a, a semicircle where uh, the slope becomes infinite at the end points. So we just want to find the centroid, which when they say centroid, they're just telling us that the density is constant. You might as well just do the computation with the density equal to some constant value, like 1. The, okay, so what we're going to need first is to find the mass of the object. Well, first, let's see, we need to set up bounds. Our x is naturally between these two constants, 0 and pi. And for each value of x, the y value starts at 0 and climbs until it hits that curve. So the y value is going to start at 0 and go till sine x. So the mass is going to be the integral from 0 to pi and from 0 to sine x on the inside of density let's see, of dm, right? But dm is going to be density dA, so we're going to have 1 times uh, dy dx. Okay, so dy dx is a little bit of area. We're multiplying by 1. This, in fact, will just find the area underneath the curve. Huh? So we integrate from 0 to pi. Let's see, the antiderivative of 1 is, with respect to y, is y. We evaluate that between sine x and 0, and we just get sine x. Oh. You see how this problem, even though we tried to set it up in, in terms of calc 1, has now reduced it. Well, all we're finding is the area underneath this curve. And so this is the usual calc 1 integral for finding the area underneath the curve. And a derivative of, of sine is negative cosine. So we have negative cosine x um, evaluated between 0 and pi. And the cosine of pi is negative 1. So we have negative negative 1 minus uh, the cosine of 0 is 1. So we have minus minus 1. So we have 1 plus 1 is 2. That gives us um, basically the area underneath this curve. Now to compute um, the moment about the x-axis, we're going to integrate from 0 to pi and from 0 to sine x. And we want distance from the x-axis, which is y dy dx. And a derivative of y is 1 half y squared. Uh, we need to evaluate that between 0 and sine x, and then finish off the integral with respect to x. So we get the integral between 0 and pi of 1 half sine squared x minus 0, right? Because we plug that in, we get 0. And the key to integrate sine squared is to remember our power reduction identity, which says that sine squared is 1 minus the cosine of 2x all over 2. We'll do that integral with respect to x. OK, almost done. We have 1 quart, one half of 1 half is 1 quarter. So the antiderivative of 1 quarter is 1 quarter x. Um, minus, we have 1 quarter cosine 2x. And that antiderivative is going to be minus 1 eighth the sine of 2x. 
you're not sure, just check the derivative. The derivative of 1 quarter x would be 1 quarter. Good. And the derivative of negative 1 eighth sine 2x will be negative 1 eighth cosine 2x times the derivative of what's inside, which kicks out another 2. That takes that 1 eighth and turns it into 1 quarter. So we're good. Just integrate that or evaluate that between 0 and pi. Now, the sine of 2 pi is 0, and so is the sine of 0. So I can see that this is not going to contribute anything to the integral. I just need to worry about this. So I get 1 quarter, one quarter pi, and, um, my, and uh, minus, when you plug in 0, you get nothing. So that's the answer, pi fourths in this case. We'll also need m sub y, the moment about the y-axis. So um, to do that, we'll integrate from 0 to pi, and from 0 to sine x. The moment about the y-axis is going to be x dy dx. OK, and the antiderivative um, with respect to y of x is just xy. And we evaluate that between 0 and sine x, and then integrate with respect to x. So the y's get replaced with sine x and the 0. That gives us the integral from 0 to pi of x sine x dx, which can be done using integration by parts. If we, um, let's go up here, we need to differentiate. We can differentiate x, and we can integrate sine x. I'll just use tabular integration by parts. I can see I can, I can differentiate the x away, right? And the antiderivative of sine is negative cosine. And the antiderivative of negative cosine is negative sine. So I'm integrating here. You can check by differentiating um, back up the column. But remember, the pattern is plus, minus, plus. So for our antiderivative, we, get, um, we trade in this integral for negative x cosine x um, minus um, 1 times negative sine. So that's going to be plus sine x. And then the integral of 0 will just be uh, 0 times negative sine x will be the integral of 0. That's just a constant. So our antiderivative is negative x cosine x plus sine x, which we evaluate between the two endpoints. Again, the sine of pi and the sine of 0 are both 0, so they don't contribute anything to the integral. When you plug in 0 here, you get nothing. So the only one that counts is when you plug in pi. When you plug in pi, you get negative pi times the cosine of pi, which is negative 1. So this integral is pi. You can finally figure out what the centroid is, because the x-coordinate of the centroid, that's x-bar, would be m sub y over m. And we calculated that m sub y was pi. And we calculated that m was 2. So pi halves is where x-bar is. And the average y value is going to be m sub x over m. And m sub x, we calculated, was pi force. So we get pi force divided by 2 is going to be pi eighths. That's what we expect because of the symmetry that the center of mass would be. There's a symmetry around this line pi halves, right? And um, the density was constant, and so we figured that it should be on that center. And then the y, y bar is pi eighths, so the x bar is pi halves and y bar pi eighths. We found our centroid.